What's up cousins, it's Ryan here and I have a tutorial for you. I am going to show you how I built a ride sharing app. Let's take a look at it. Okay, so on the left side of the screen I have my physical Android device which is logged in as a driver. Let's go ahead and log in as a passenger on the emulator over here. Okay. Now I just want to show you the profile feature really quickly. We can set a thumbnail. There's no actual photos on this emulator because it's a fresh emulator, but you can just click on this button and an intent chooser will pop up here. Anyways, let's go ahead and set up a ride. Yeah, it just takes a moment to load, but here we are. And I'm going to hit check again over on my uh, physical device here. And as you can see, it's popped up there. Let's go ahead and click on this and just watch both screens. Awesome. So what I'm going to do next is I'm going to change the location of my physical device using an app which kind of spoofs the location. And as you can see, that has updated the location on both of the devices. Okay, so what we're going to do now is test out the chat feature. So I'm going to send a message as a uh, passenger. And just notice the UI has changed, and now it says you have messages. Let's go ahead and respond as the driver. Now, there's a lot more you can do with Chat SDK's pre-made user interface. This is really just a very basic impl implementation, and I'll show you how to do that later. Anyways, let's go ahead and hit back and back, and we will finish the ride off. So I'm just going to hold this button down to pick up the passenger. Obviously, we haven't actually picked up the passenger because we're not in the right location. And let's just pretend that we've dropped them off at the appropriate location. And as you can see, the ride is completed on both sides. I can finally hit return to dashboard, which will clear this ride out. And there you have it. This tutorial has been sponsored by Stream. I would not have made it without their support. Whether you're working on Android, iOS, web, backend, or even game development, Stream probably has a tool for you. In this tutorial, we will be using Stream's chat SDK not only to power messaging between drivers and passengers, but actually the whole ride-sharing functionality of the app. Pretty cool, huh? The best way to follow along with this tutorial is to clone or download the starting point branch of the codebase. You can do this quickly from the Android Studio menu by going to File, New, Project from Version Control, and pasting in the link to the repo. I also advise you to clone the completed project, which is in the master branch, or just have it open in a browser in case you get stuck. This tutorial will follow a code lab style where the starting point will be missing some parts of the code base, but by no means all. We will write the missing parts together following a logical progression. Other parts will either be discussed line by line, summarized by me, or left up to you to look into. As a more senior developer, I actually do most of my learning by studying source code. It's a habit that I encourage you to build as well. This tutorial is loaded with information, like I always do, so here's a quick overview of what you will learn. A reactive MVVM architecture presentation layer, which borrows what I like from MVI and ignores the stuff I don't like so much. We will set that up using coroutines and flows. I'll show you how to use both Compose and XML in a project pretty seamlessly. Don't play this Compose team versus XML team that I see on Twitter all the time. They're both tools that have different strengths and weaknesses, and that's okay. I'll show you how to set up simple, easy, and effective dependency injection and navigation using Gabor Verratti's Simple Stack library. You will want to see how to set this up because it's amazingly easy. We will work heavily with Stream's chat SDK and make use of their user and channel data storage to actively drive, excuse the pun, the ride-sharing features of the app. Last but not least, we will use Google Places to create autocomplete destination searches, Google Maps to track passengers and drivers, as well as Google Directions to draw directions over top of the map. Now, the idea here is to show you how to build an MVP or minimum viable product. In particular, this app is not optimized for a variety of screen sizes, and we won't be doing any meaningful validation during the user signup process. So with that in mind, let's take a look at the architecture of this application. In both the Compose and XML-based screens, we will be using a pretty vanilla MVVM architecture. I generally prefer an approach to MVVM where we have one view model per screen, and that view model fetches and holds the state necessary to draw that specific screen. 
Standard rules apply. Our view model can publish data which the view observes, but the view model may not talk directly to the view. The view will frequently call functions on the view model. Now, for our more complicated screens, we will use an approach which is similar to what you see in MVI. Most of the UI will be rendered based on a model of that UI which the view will observe changes to. This model will be created by a state machine which observes multiple asynchronous data sources. However, we are not going to bind the entire UI to one model, and we're not going to play around with reducers and so on. If that's your thing, that's cool. I will also borrow a concept from clean architecture, but you will see that I don't follow clean architecture religiously. We will have use cases in a situation where multiple services must be coordinated to fulfill a single flow, like for example, logging in. However, we're not going to have use cases that just make a single call to a single service function because that's just a pointless extra layer. As someone who used to follow these principles religiously, here's a tip. Whether we're talking about clean architecture, solid principles, or whatever else, use these things only to the extent that they solve more problems than they create. For backend, we will use Firebase Auth for initial authorization of users. Stream actually has integrations with Firebase that make it so that creating a new user in Firebase will also create a user in Stream's servers. Now, we will store the actual user data in Stream except for the profile avatars. We will use Firebase Storage to store the user's avatars, but the URL to set avatars will be stored as part of the user data in Stream. I want to point out that we will not be configuring Firebase in this tutorial. Firebase isn't critical to making this application work. It's just a stand-in for you or your company's session management server. A ride-sharing app is probably going to have some kind of data model to represent a ride. Originally, I was going to use Firebase for this as well, but partway into building this app, I learned that channels in Chat SDK allow you to store all the data that you need. So each ride will have a channel, and this will make messaging a breeze as well. For location data, apart from system services, we will use a variety of Google services for maps, address searching, and directions. Now, you will have to configure your own cloud services console. Again, there's lots of resources floating around on the web for that. I will show you how to use these things programmatically. I'm just not going to regurgitate their onboarding documentation for you. So with that, let's look at the code. Okay, so go ahead and open up the style.kt file. So we're not gonna go super deep into Compose, we're just gonna cover some basics here. If you want a lot more information on that, consider checking out my free introductory course on Compose, which is available on my channel. Uh, now what we are gonna do here is, obviously we have set some basic colors up and also a font family. You can do a lot more with Compose when it comes to styles and templating. This is really just like a bare bones setup. Now, if you're wondering where these fonts are coming from, you can open up the Project Explorer and you'll see that they're included in the res font directory. Anyways, let's open up login screen and we're gonna start doing some typing. Also, I have to apologize, my keyboard's kind of on a weird angle here, so I'm gonna be making plenty of typing mistakes. Get used to it. Before we add any code, what is the view model doing here? It's basically going to hold the data necessary to render the composables appropriately. And it also has some functions which can handle user interface events like clicks and things like that. So we're going to add a column here and I'm gonna try not to totally screw this up. So we're gonna go modifier uh, dot fill max size. And then we're gonna add background and we're gonna add a color here. Uh, what I'll do is we'll type this out and I'll explain it in a little more detail in a moment. And then we're also gonna add some alignment here. So horizontal alignment will be alignment.center horizontally. And then vertical alignment will be arrangement top. So basically what we're saying here is we want the background of the column, which will fill all the available screen size to be white, and it's going to fill that maximum size. And then we want the content in the column to be centered horizontally, but we also want it to sort of shoot up to the top. Anyways, moving on. So what we can do now, I just hit Control Alt Enter there, uh, just to kind of format things. Um, we're going to add some child composables. Uh, so we're gonna add something that's actually already created first, and this is going to be an Unter header. And I'll explain what that is in a minute. And for that, we're just gonna add some padding. We're gonna do top equals 64.dip, so we have some space from the top of the screen. And then we're going to add subtitle text, which the autocomplete is not helping here. It looks like I have gone out of the brackets and that would be the issue. So we're gonna do subtitle text. 
Oh, come on, help me out here. <laughs> Expect a lot of this. Subtitle text equals string resource. So whenever you have a string resource, so something in strings.xml, and you want to pull it into compose, you can use this function here. And what is our ID? So this is going to be r.string.needRide, which is sort of like the tagline for the application. I'm going to hit Control alt enter again. Now, what we're going to do next is let's jump into common.kt and just take a look at what this unter header is. So we can see it down here. So um, what you want to think about in Compose, generally speaking, is you want to try to create sort of individual or modular components for your composables, which are sort of equivalent to like views. And uh, if you have a composable which you share across multiple screens, you might want to go ahead and throw that in a common file or something like that. So that's why we have that here. Anyways, let's go ahead and add some more. So we're going to add something called an email input field. And for that, no, that's not what we want. Don't do that auto import in case it does that. So we're going to do another modifier equals modifier dot padding. And it's going to show up red because we haven't created it. We'll do 16 dip padding on the top. And then we will pass in our view model like so. View model equals view model. And one thing we can do here is you can hit alt enter. Oh, that's not what I wanted to do. Never mind. I wanted it to build a, to pull up the uh, thing which automatically generates a function, but I guess because we already have one of these composables in a different function, it wants to import that one. My bad, I probably should have made it private. Anyways, what we're going to do down below is we're going to type COMP, which is a shortcut to create a composable function, and this is going to say input email, sorry, email input field, and just like our uh, call site up above, we're going to pass in a modifier, which will be of type modifier, you guessed it. And then we'll also pass in our view model and it's helping us with some autocomplete here. Okay, cool. Now what we're going to use here is an outline text field. And it's sort of like a, so a text field is kind of like equivalent to an edit text if you're used to XML. It's just a text field. Hopefully you know what that is if you don't Google it. But it's just styled a little bit differently with an outline. Um, so we're going to add a couple things here. Let's just hit tab, tab, and clear out the autocomplete. So what we want to add first is a modifier. So we're going to say modifier equals modifier. So this will be the modifier that we're passing in. And we're then going to add a value. So the value is going to be view model dot email. I realize we haven't written that. What we'll do later on is we'll jump into that view model and see exactly what's going on. And then in on value change, we're going to pass in a lambda expression, which we can do using just these brackets here. On value change basically is going to be triggered when the text inside of this uh, composable text field changes. And what we want to do there is we want to say view model dot update email. And then we just pass in it, which refers to the text that will be present in the text field. Uh, we're also going to say keyboard options. And we're going to say uh, keyboard options. And then we'll pass in a keyboard type here. And that should be keyboard type dot email because this is an email input field. And then one final thing, we're going to add a label, which is somewhat equivalent to like a hint if you're familiar with the XML system. It's just like a helpful little label which will be present on the uh, text field. And inside of that, we're going to pass in a text composable. And the text is going to be string resource. And what did I call it? I think r.string.email, I believe. Okay. And that is actually all we need to do for this particular composable. Okay, so next we're going to add in a password input field. So what I'm going to do there is let's just go ahead and copy this whole composable and we'll paste it down below. And this is going to say password, oops, password input field like so. And let's see here. So this one is going to be kind of similar, but we're going to add a couple extra things here. So sometimes we want to hoist the state. So for example, what's actually in the text fields into the view model, but other times we want to sort of manage the state within a composable itself. 
there's no like clear answer about which way is better. It really just depends on what you're trying to achieve here. So we're going to add a remembered uh, variable here, which is going to be var show password. And we're going to say by. So can't really explain this really easily, but by is kind of like a, a delegate, if I'm not mistaken. But it's sort of like a fancy way of creating something. So we're going to do remember savable. And within the uh, angle brackets here, we're going to say mutable state of false. So um, what we're doing here is when we use a remember or a remember savable value, we're basically telling the sort of composed framework that we want this value to be watched and maintained. And anytime we change this value, we want to recompose or redraw some part of the user interface. Moving on. So what we're going to do is we are going to just add a couple different fields here. So the first thing I want to add is a visual transformation. So uh, under on value changed, we're going to say, let's add a little uh, comma there. We're going to say visual transformation. And you'll see what this is in just a moment. We're going to do, uh, so if show password, um, then we'll say visual transformation dot none. Else, um, password visual transformation and I don't have any screen real estate here so we got to add a uh, just a function call brackets on the end of that so basically what this is going to do is depending on the show password state we're either going to be showing little dots as characters to hide the password or the user can actually show their password if they want um, and then the next thing that we want to do is let's just make sure we set this keyboard type to password like so We'll change the label to password as well, I think it's called. And then there's one more thing we need to add here, which is going to be trailing icon. And you can just give that another Lambda expression. Okay, so what we're gonna do is we're gonna say val image equals if show password, which is again our remembered variable up here. Then we're going to say icons.filled.visibility else icons.filled dot uh, visibility off. So that's like a little eyeball icon, either it's like open or it's sort of like slashed out and you get the idea. And then we also want to add a description in here. So what we're gonna do is we're going to say val description equals if show password, then string resource r.string dot hide password else uh, we're going to do string resource again. And one moment, just got to scroll to the side here. And that's going to be our, oops, wrong window I'm typing in, our uh, dot string dot show password. Okay, and then we're just going to add one more thing. So we're going to add the actual icon itself. So go ahead and do icon button. I can't type. And for on click, we are going to change our remembered variables value. So we're just going to flip it by saying show password equals uh, not show password. So basically, if you're not familiar with Booleans, this is just a way of flipping the Boolean from like true to false or vice versa. And then inside of the icon button, we're going to set up an icon composable. We're going to use image vector here. Pro tip, if it's like a little icon or some simple graphic, you pretty much always want to be using a uh, SVG or a vector graphic. Okay, and that's basically it for our password text field. Okay, so next we're going to add another composable and this one's going to be called login con continue button. And this one is going to take in a modifier like so. And then it's gonna take in something a little bit different. So we're gonna say handle login here. And then we're going to actually use a Kotlin uh, function type. And I'll explain a little bit more how that works and what it is in a moment. So we're going to add a button composable and uh, we'll deal with on click in just a moment. Wow, I just wanna select a single thing here, thank you. So modifier equals modifier, the one with, that we pass in. We're gonna change the colors of the button. So how did how we do that in Compose is we do uh, button defaults dot button colors. 
and then we're going to specify the background color and that background color is going to be color primary which is sort of like a azure blue type tinge and then the content color which will be the text color and that's going to be color white okay for our on click we're going to type handle login except we have to actually spell it properly handle login and so what's going to happen here is we're passing a function type reference in and we're invoking it and we'll see how it works up the chain later then we also want to add in a text composable uh, the text is going to say uh, string resource dot so r dot string dot continue string continue um, I think that's the correct one yeah there's some specific reason why it says string continue but I can't remember it at the moment um, and then we're going to give it a style. So for this, we're going to say typography dot button, which is something we set in the style.kt file. Okay, so now that that's done, let's add our composables uh, to the parent column. Okay, so we have our unter header, we have the email input field. Let's just go ahead and copy this and we'll do password input field like so and then we will add our button which is going to be a login continue button and for the modifier we're going to say modifier dot padding and then we're going to do top equals uh, let's see here 32 dip and then uh, we also need to give it our handle login function here so what we can do you can just throw it in the lambda expression here but just because this might not be totally clear to some people who aren't experts in Kotlin. We're going to say handle login, and we're going to give it a Lambda expression here, and we're going to type view model dot handle login. Now, one thing I need to explain here is we could have easily just passed in the view model and called view model dot handle login in the login button composable. I just wanted to show you something that is very important with uh, compose which is that you want to learn how to use function types because there's certain situations where it's a lot easier to handle something with a function type as opposed to passing an object in. In this case, not necessarily, but I just wanted to demonstrate that for you. All right, we only have one more composable left, which is going to be our sign, sign up text composable. For that one, we're gonna pass in modifier equals modifier.padding. And uh, for padding, we're gonna do top equals 32 dip again. And then we are gonna pass in the view model down into here. So we'll say view model equals view model. Okay, and then let's just scroll to the very bottom. Now, what are we doing here? The sign up text, it's kind of like a button with a link in the middle. So what I'm gonna demonstrate to you is how to create like a text composable that is clickable and it's going to have some of the text colored differently. So that's really what we're demonstrating here. So we're gonna do, again, type comp as a uh, live template, and it's gonna say sign up text, yep. And then we're gonna do modifier, and then we're also gonna do our view model. Thank you, autocomplete for a change. I'm just gonna scroll down a tiny bit. So we're gonna use a text button here, and uh, I love it that it gives me the on click automatically every time. All right, so um, we're gonna set the modifier as the modifier that we have passed in. Oh, that didn't work, come on, work with me. Okay, and then we're gonna do on click. So inside of on click, we're going to say view model dot go to sign up. So this would be the case where we're just passing the view model in and calling a function on it, works too. All right, now inside of this text button, we're going to add a text composable. And we need to do a couple things here. So we're going to style the text as typography dot subtitle two. And these were all things that I worked out ahead of time in terms of, of the typography in Figma actually. Um, and then for the text, we're gonna use something new, which is going to be build, oops, <laughs> let's try that again, build annotated string. So this is a situation where you want to build some kind of string, but you want to change different properties about it. It'll be easier to sort of understand once we actually write the code. So if you've never used a build annotated string or build string sort of function call, 
It's sort of a neat way to set up a string builder in Kotlin. I'm a big fan of it. What you do is you can append parts to the string that will eventually be outputted using the append command. Um, the first thing we're going to add is we're going to add string resource. Um, and this is going to be, let's see here, r dot r dot string dot no account. Then we're going to append just a space. And then we're going to do something different. We're going to say with style. And this is the interesting part. Within with style, we're going to type span style. A um, little bit hard to explain what a span is, but basically think of it as like a portion of a text field. I apologize that my mouse wheel is all over the place. It's a new mouse. Okay, so color equals color primary. So what we're doing here is we're coloring this portion of the text a different color, essentially. Um, and then we're also going to do text decoration. And that's going to be text decoration dot underline. So we're going to make it underline so it looks like a clickable link. And then we're, we also need to add a lambda expression here. So we do append. And in here we say the actual text that we want to append. String resource r dot string dot sign up. I think it's sign up here. Yep. Okay. And then we're going to add a few more things below that inside of our string builder. So we're going to do append. And that's going to say just another space. And then finally, let's just go ahead and copy paste this. Just that here. And we're going to say, what is this one here? Yep. So string here. And assuming I didn't screw anything up, we now have a sort of clickable text composable, which has multiple different uh, colors inside of the text. Okay, so one uh, quick correction here. This is supposed to say update password. Now let's just jump into the view model really quickly and just take a look. So we're not going to be writing this code. We will write some view model code later. So these are sort of the variables that we track inside of the text fields. There's multiple different ways to do this. I saw a blog recently written that showed sort of how to manage this inside of the composable. And truthfully, I just found it simplest to manage it inside of the view model itself. Um, mutable state of sort of generates, if I can find it here, control P. Okay, close enough. Um, so it's going to create like a mutable state object that our composables can observe. So each time that state gets updated, then the uh, composable will presumably recompose. And um, we're setting it privately, privately so through a, uh, a setter. And then we're going to talk a whole bunch more about things like coroutines and navigation and stuff like that. But this is a pretty simple view model here. So anyways, yeah, how to set up view models, we're going to cover that later. I just wanted to give you a quick sneak peek. So we're only going to be building one XML layout, which is going to be the map layout, which is shared across both the passenger dashboard and the driver dashboard. Go ahead and open up view map layout. And what we'll do here is first we want to add in our map view. So I'm just going to type uh, angle brace here and we can type map view and it should auto complete for us. And then I'm just going to go down and close off that particular XML tag. So what we're doing here is we have a constraint layout as the parent layout. And basically how constraint layout works is we tell the child views. So or basically the views or the tags inside of the constraint layout, um, how they are supposed to be or where they are constrained to. And those constraints are generally either going to be to the parent. So in this case, the constraint layout or they're going to be other views inside of that same layout. And there is some other tricks which I'll show you along the way, but let's kind of just dive in here. So first we're going to give this thing an ID, and the ID is going to be app plus ID slash map view, like so. And a quirk of constraint layout is that if you want the view to sort of resize appropriately to the constraints, most often you will want to give it a zero dip width and height. Sometimes you might want to change that. Sometimes you want it to be like wrap content height or something like that. But if you're getting like weird behavior with constraint layout, sometimes what you need to do is you need to set layout width and or and or layout height to zero dip. Down below, we're going to add in some constraints. So I actually have a live template called constrain. And unfortunately, you're just going to have to type this out if you don't. But it basically just adds in constraints top and start and bottom to the parent. 
And what we're going to do here is once you've added that in, I'm just going to hit or delete that line here. And we're going to do something a little bit different. So we're going to add in layout constraint dimension ratio. And that ratio is going to be 5 to 3.5. So basically what we're saying here is we want the width and height to sort of be a ratio, essentially. Um, off the top of my head, I can't remember which is which because I'm bad at math. But my goal here is I wanted the map view to be something around like a little bit more than a third of the screen height. There's a lot of different ways you could do this. You could use like a constraint guide and a percentage and then constrain the map view to that. But this is just one example of setting it up pretty quickly. Okay, next we are going to add in a text view here. And for the width, it's going to be zero dip. And then for the height, it's going to be wrap content in this case. And we can go ahead and close that off. All right, so our ID is going to be subtitle. Now, um, when we're going to be using view binding in this project. And for that reason, I don't really suggest you use a snake case. So snake case being like having underscores and stuff like that. I'm not actually sure if it automatically converts into camel case, but yeah, um, I would suggest you use camel case to name these things, even though that it used to be a convention to use snake case. All right, so I have another uh, template, which is called TS, which means text style, and it's just going to add in some boilerplate text styles here. So we're going to do for the text itself, um, let's see here. This one doesn't actually have any particular text because this is something we set at runtime, but I'm going to do something else, which is I'm going to change this namespace to tools. And what this will do is it allow me to set some kind of text here. Uh, in this case, we'll say maybe passenger location. Uh, it allows us to set that during the design time. Um, we probably can't really, yeah, we can kind of preview it here. Whatever we include in a tools namespace will be stripped out at compile time. So it's like a design time preview, and I use this feature quite a lot. For the text size, we're going to use 16. For the font family, we're going to use Poppins Medium. And for the color, we're going to use color slash color light gray, which you can find in the colors.xml file. And then we're also going to add this include font, font padding equals false. The reason why we're doing that is the Poppins font itself has its kind of own padding setup, and it can cause some weird behavior when it comes to arranging the text. So we basically are saying we want to control the font padding and sort of use the defaults. Uh, and then we're going to I'm going to type constrain again here. So we're going to constrain just the bottom and the sides. So the end and start are going to be to parent. And then we're going to do bottom to bottom of at plus, sorry, at plus ID slash cancel button, which is something that we have, uh, we're going to be adding down below in a bit. All right. Now, let me just make sure I did everything correct here. Let's see, we've got width, height, name, colors, include font padding. We are missing uh, margin start. Especially when I'm writing this XML stuff, you're probably going to want to just double check that this is all correct in the uh, completed code base because uh, there's a pretty high chance that I will make some small errors here and there. All right. Um, this is totally repetitive here, so we can just select this all and hit control forward slash, or if you're on a Mac, command forward slash to just uncomment this text view. There was nothing really new or interesting here, so we didn't bother uh, to write it. We will, however, write out a button. Uh, so the this is going to be wrap content and wrap content, and we'll just do a forward slash there to close it off. The ID is going to be cancel button and we'll do I'm going to type TS again you can copy and paste from before if you like uh, so the text is going to be cancel the text size is going to be 14 SP uh, the font family is going to be medium again the color is going to be white 
you'll notice um, so this particular color I'm actually getting from like the Android resources that way I just don't have to bother defining it myself and then font padding yes uh, I'm assuming we have some margin so we're gonna do margin horizontal and that's going to be 16 dip we're going to do margin top which is going to be 8 dip and uh, did I miss anything? We're going to set the background tint to be a different color. So this is going to be color red. That's going to set the background of the button to be red, essentially. And I think that's everything. Let's just constrain it. So we're going to do, here's a little tip. Um, there's sort of, uh, what do you call them? Live templates for constraints. So I'm going to type top bot, and that's going to help me do top to bottom so I don't have to type the whole thing. I can't remember who showed me that, but props to that person. And then we're going to do map view here. And then now we're going to do end, end, which will help us again. And that's just going to be to the parent. Okay, so assuming I didn't screw anything up and maybe it's just taking a minute to update, but it looks like I might have. That is our map view layout here and the basics of building a XML layout using constraint layout. We're now going to set up our chat screen using some pre-made components from Stream's chat SDK. Now, a ride sharing app doesn't require a ton of features for chat, so please keep in mind that we are going to be setting up a bare bones chat implementation. Check out Stream's documentation for more details on what you can build and how to build something a lot more sort of expansive than what we have here. Anyways, the cool thing is that this is going to be really easy using some pre-made components. So um, go ahead and open up the fragment chat XML file and I just want to bring your attention to the message list view and the message input view. The message list view is basically a component from streams chat SDK. Uh, I think the UI um, import in particular uh, which we can plug right into our app and basically have it manage the user interface for us which is pretty awesome. So the message list view di displays the list of messages essentially the conversation and the message input view is where we type in our messages and send them. We also have a toolbar up top, just so the user can go back. And with that, let's jump into the chat fragment. So this project is, at least for the XML part, using view binding. I just want to show you really quickly how to set that up. You're going to want to go into the build.gradle file. This is already configured for you, but just for future reference. And in the Android uh, script, or whatever this is called, task, there's going to be a build features subtask down below here and you just want to set view binding equals true. And what that's going to do is it's going to allow us to use view binding, which we will learn about now. Um, one little tip here. So if you want to sort of skip the on create lifecycle function because it's kind of just pointless and all you're calling in it is like set content view, you can skip that by actually passing in the layout file into the argument of the fragment itself. So fragment chat. And this will work whether you're using a keyed fragment, which we'll kind of look at later, um, or if you're using just like a regular old fragment. Anyways, so uh, let's get started here. So the first thing we want to do is we want to add the binding object. So just below the view model. By the way, just ignore how this view model is created. I will explain this later when we get into uh, simple stack but it's basically dependency injection via simple stack. Uh, anyways, so let's go ahead and add our binding. So we're gonna do late init var binding, and that's going to equal fragment chat binding. So once you enable view binding in build.gradle, um, it's going to generate these files for you. This is not a file that we actually write ourselves, and the files are based on the name of the XML layout. So just pro tip there. Anyways, let's just go ahead and uncomment out super.onView created. And what we're going to do here is we're going to say binding equals fragment chat binding dot bind. And we're going to pass in view here. Okay. Now, how to actually use the binding? Basically, how it works is we can say binding dot and we can refer to any of the views in our layout. If you just want to like refer to a single layout, so for example, our bike back icon, we can just do back icon uh, set on click listener. And inside there we can do view model 
dot uh, handle back button. So that is one particular way you can do it. Also just a quick tip that you don't need to do, but oftentimes you wanna use binding with a bunch of different layouts. So we can also do binding dot apply. And then now we have access to all of the layouts inside of this binding. And it just saves us having to type binding dot every time. So just a quick little tip there. Okay. Now this is going to be pretty cool. So first, what we need to do is we're going to need the ID of the channel, which is passed into this feature. Again, we'll talk about how to do that later, but to get a hold of this thing, we're going to say val channel ID, which is going to be a string equals get key as chat key dot channel ID. And, um, let me, oh, I misspelled key there. That's why that's not working. Okay, so basically what we're doing is once you're set up with SimpleStack, which we'll talk about uh, sort of in the next section of this tutorial, uh, this is, for example, how to get a hold of an argument that you pass into this particular destination. Don't worry about that. Just understand we're getting the ID of the channel that, and when I say channel, I mean like a chat channel that we're going to be using to allow the passenger and the driver to talk to each other. All right, now this is really neat here. So we're going to create a message list view model. Uh, so this is gonna be, me yeah, message list view model. And again, this is something that comes from the stream chat SDK. And basically what it's going to do is uh, it is going to, this is gonna be by view models. It's going to actually manage the chat in the application almost entirely. We just have to configure this stuff and then to quote Todd Howard, it just works, but it actually just works. Now, what we need to do here is we need to pass in a factory. So we're gonna say message list view model factory. We're going to do CID. So CID is the ID of the channel plus the type of channel. Don't worry about it too much. We'll talk about that more later. And then we also need a view model for our uh, text input. So we're gonna say message input view model. And we'll make sure that we change that over here as well. And then we can, I believe, use the same factory. So that part is fine. And then the last thing we need to do here is we need to actually bind the views to the view model. So we can say message list view model dot bind view. And here we're going to say binding dot message list view. And then we also need to give it a lifecycle uh, owner, I believe. Let me just double check here. Yes, lifecycle owner. And so what is the lifecycle owner? Basically, we're passing in this fragment sort of lifecycle and the view models are going to be bound to it. So when this particular fragment is navigated away from, it's going to automatically inform the view models and they should be updated appropriately or cancel any work that they have going on. We're also going to add our message input view model. Again, bind view. This time we're gonna do binding dot message input view. And again, view lifecycle owner. And that is all we need to do. Chat is configured in our application. Pretty awesome, huh? Go ahead and open up the file called unter app. Now the application class is useful for various things, but primarily for managing global application state. In simpler terms, if you want things that last the entire lifetime of an Android program, also known as a process, this is generally speaking going to be the best place to set them up. Just be careful that you don't create memory leaks. Now let's go ahead and take a quick look at global services at the top here. Okay, so global services is a class from SimpleStack. If you've ever used coin, dagger, or hilt, it's kind of a similar idea. It's a configurable object which can both manage and provide dependencies. We're going to scroll down to the onCreate function. Okay, so the onCreate function is where we are going to be creating application scoped dependencies. Um, in so this word scope basically is another word for life cycle, and you're gonna be hearing this term a lot in this tutorial. Whenever you hear the term scope, you want to think of it as another word for life cycle. In this particular case, these things are going to live and die following the application's life cycle. So managing dependencies is one thing, but providing them to other classes is also really important. 
So let me show you how to do that using global services. We're not going to be typing any code out, but we're just going to kind of take a quick look at it. Now, I strongly encourage you to take a look at SimpleStacks documentation because there's a lot more you can do with this awesome tool. Um, just a quick sort of reminder here, up here we are creating dependencies and this is how we're going to set them up to be provided uh, when we need them. So what you're gonna do is you're gonna basically create a global services builder and any dependency that you want to be able to provide to some other part of your application, you're either going to add it and or you are going to both add and rebind it. So what does add mean? So let's say we have some kind of service, like for example, login user, which is a use case. Some part of this application is going to want to use that use case. And if, it, if the part of the application that is using the dependency does not need to know it through its interface or through some kind of abstraction, then you can just add it like so. Let's say, for example, we want some other part of the application to use the stream ride service. So stream ride service is an interface. And I don't actually want the part of the app that uses ride service to know that the implementation, the concrete class is stream ride service. What we do in that case is first we add it and then we call rebind. So in the rebind, uh, generic type here, we give the abstraction, the interface, instead of the concrete name of the actual class. And then when we provide this dependency or inject it, it will be known as the interface instead. So that's pretty much all there is to it. Just don't forget to call build. In this application, I use fragments as the root lifecycle container for each feature of the application. We can refer to each fragment as a destination and key classes, which you can see an example of one here, are how you define a destination in SimpleStack. For more details, I strongly encourage you to visit github.com slash Zwinden slash SimpleStack. Uh, Gabor has a pretty expansive readme and there's a lot of different parts to this uh, library. In this tutorial, we're pretty much just going to be covering fragment-based navigation specifically, but I want you to know that the library isn't limited to just fragment-based navigation. Anyways, uh, let's go ahead and highlight this here. So instantiate fragment, this is basically where we specify which fragment or destination that we want to actually be creating. Um, we also have get scope tag down here. This is kind of like a unique identifier is the easiest way of explaining it. It's gonna sort of take some stuff based on the data in this particular class that we've created here and it's going to translate it into a unique ID essentially, uh, or it should be unique anyways. And then more importantly, we have this uh, bind services function down here. So if you want to use SimpleStack for dependency injection, you're going to want to make sure that your keys, which again is sort of like an identifier for a destination, uh, implements the default service provider dot has services interface. That will give you both the get scope tag uh, override function as well as bind services. So the way I think about these services is it's basically any kind of class which is bound to the life cycle of this particular destination. Naturally, since we are using MVVM architecture with feature specific view models, we will be scoping them to the life cycle of a particular view or fragment or destination. Um, the way that we can do this is with the add function. Obviously this is going to add a new service and then we're going to pass in the service itself, which in this case is a view model. Now, this part down here, lookup, is especially important. So basically, remember all those things we configured a moment ago in uh, UnterApp, all those different dependencies? This is basically how we get a hook to them. Um, all we have to do is, if I just jump into the de uh, dependencies here, we can see that we require a get user as a dependency for splash view model, and lookup is the way that we can do it. Now I want to show you another example real quick. So let's go to passenger dashboard key, uh, or you can just watch. This particular view model requires quite a number of different dependencies, and basically this is how we provide them. As you can see here, we're just successively calling lookup for every dependency that we require. Now you might be wondering what backstack is. 
it's a little tricky to explain, but if you're familiar with like Jetpack navigation, it's sort of like a nav controller. We're actually going to see how to work with this thing in a moment. In this project, we are not using Jetpack view model. It's not because I think Jetpack view model is bad. It's actually one of my favorite Jetpack libraries. But since we're using SimpleStack to manage the view model's lifecycle and provide it or inject it into our fragments, there's not really any point in using Jetpack view model here. So I just want to highlight the dependencies here. So here are the actual dependencies we injected earlier. And I also want you to note that this view model extends scoped services dot activated. This interface gives our view model lifecycle callbacks essentially. So I'm going to scroll down to on service activated. Okay, so in on service activated, which is kind of like an on start function, we can fetch the data necessary to draw things on screen. Uh, generally, that's going to be like, for example, checking the auth state or, or something similar. And then we also have on service inactive. So in on service inactive, uh, it's kind of like an equivalent to on stop. One thing we can do here is we can, for example, cancel all of the asynchronous work that we might be doing. We will talk a lot more about coroutines and setting this stuff up, stuff up later. Um, so yeah, anyways, I want to just highlight something here, which is uh, send to dashboard. So this is how we actually use simple stack to navigate to different features of the application. So what we do in this feature is we request the current user if one exists. If one doesn't exist, we just send them to the login screen. And to do that, uh, where is that function? Up above, I guess. What we can do is we can call, for example, backstack.setHistory. Then we do history.of and login key. Note that this uh, function here actually allows you to pass in a collection of different keys in case you want to do some fun stuff with the backstack. Now, why am I using set history here? Basically, from the splash screen, I don't really want the user to be able to back press to the splash screen. So instead, what we're doing is we're basically saying, send the user to the uh, login screen, which is defined by login key, and sort of make that the root of the back stack, the root destination. Also, this is a handy little thing for animations. You can do like state change dot forward or state change dot replace or state change dot backward. It's just basically sets up animations for you. Now down in send to dashboard, what we're doing here is we're basically setting up conditional navigation. So if the returned user is of type uh, passenger or driver, we want to send them to the appropriate uh, dashboard. Let me just show you what passenger type looks like. If my mouse wheel will click, come on, you can do it. There we go. New mouse, apologies. Anyways, we have this thing called user type and it, it can either be of type passenger or driver, basically. Those are the two types that we have in the application. So based on that status, we send them to the appropriate dashboard key uh, or dashboard destination, depending on what their state is. So yeah, that's basically the basics of navigating with um, SimpleStack. Another thing you can do, let me see, do I have an example here? Yeah, we'll go to login view model. So sometimes you want to go to a destination and you want to be able to like back press to the previous destination. In that case, you can just do like backstack.go to. Like I keep saying, there's more things you can do with this library uh, to do with destination or navigating. So you're gonna wanna check out the documentation to just uh, figure out the full capabilities. But yeah, that's basically how you navigate or at least the basics of navigation using simple stack. Let's do a quick overview of the data sources for driver dashboard. Firstly, we need to fetch the driver's user data. Secondly, there is a list of rides which do not currently have a driver associated with them. This list may or may not be empty. Thirdly, the user must allow their location data to be accessed via permission request if necessary. Fourthly, their location retrieved from the system must be updated frequently. Fifthly, if they are in an active ride, we must fetch that data. One approach to dealing with all of this complexity and asynchronous event sources is to create a state machine. In short, each time an event stream shoves some data into the state machine, we compute a new state for the user interface to draw. With that overview, let's jump into the code. Okay, we're now going to learn about coroutines, flows, and all things reactive. Go ahead and open up driver dashboard view model. Now, I want to bring your attention to this coroutine scope interface, which all of our view models implement. If I delete that, notice how this thing shows up as red. 
So basically what we're seeing here is that when we designate something as a coroutine scope, it requires us to set up a coroutine context, uh, for example, like we have here. Now, by implementing coroutine scope, we can achieve three things in the view model. Uh, so firstly, we can make our view model become sort of like a launch pad for any asynchronous work that needs to be done. Also, I'm just going to highlight canceler here. So in the get accessor for our coroutine context, which you can see down here, we can supply a job object. In simple terms, this allows us to get a hook into our coroutine context, which is comprised of both this dispatchers.main and canceler thing, and cancel any asynchronous work uh, which might be going on. And this is something we would want to do if I scroll way down to on service inactive. And in this case, what we're doing is when this lifecycle function is called, it's going to cancel all the uh, coroutines that are associated with this particular coroutine scope. Now, um, lastly, we can specify how we launch the coroutines from this view model in terms of the threading by supplying a dispatcher here. So that's another really important thing. When you're working on uh, Android in particular, you want to be using the main dispatcher. If you're using a Jetpack view model dash KTX or whatever that thing is, you can also use like a view model scope, I think. But in this particular case, we're just going to use dispatchers.main. Now, um, later in the tutorial, we are going to jump off of the main thread when we're doing long running operations. And I'll show you how to do that later on, of course. So uh, let's just go down to a launch. If I can find one here, there should be one somewhere. Sure, let's look at just launch get passengers list. Okay, so what I want to sort of explain here is after we have set up our uh, coroutine scope, we can launch coroutines from our view models coroutine context. One way to think about this is if I type this dot launch, you can kind of see that that's actually what's happening. We're launching these coroutines using the launch coroutine builder from this particular view model. Now I want to point something out here. You can see me saying dispatchers.main here. This is actually not necessary to do. Um, I think that's just actually a mistake, full disclosure from before, but it will already be bound to the dispatchers.main, which is sort of like the main thread. Now, the other thing I want to mention about launch is the way it kind of works and the flow of the application. And we'll see more, plenty more examples of this later. So what launch is going to do when we launch it from the main thread, it's going to be operating on the main thread, but it's not going to be blocking the main thread, which is a really important feature here. I don't have time to really deep dive into coroutines, but that's something you want to be aware of. We're not going to be blocking the main thread. And one important aspect here is that this block you can see here, and this is also true inside of suspend functions, is going to execute in a sequential order. So even though it's asynchronous, meaning we don't know exactly when a result is going to get returned or a, a function call is going to evaluate, it's still going to be kind of going line by line by line. Um, it's not gonna be like jumping around the execution point. It will wait until a particular function finishes. And personally, I far prefer this approach over using sort of like callbacks. To me, I'd far rather use a sequential style of writing asynchronous code because I just find it easier to write, easier to read, and sort of easier to think about. Okay, coding time. So now we're gonna learn some basics of using flow. So what we're gonna do is above uh, map is ready, we're going to add something called driver model. So we're gonna say private val underscore driver model equals mutable state flow. And we're gonna pass in a generic type here, which is unter user nullable. And then we are going to pass in an initial value in the case of mutable state flow, you can give it an initial value in the argument of null, which means we're going to be starting this sort of observable flowable with a null value. Now, mutable state flow is quite similar to uh, mutable live data if you're familiar at all. Um, also, I've added an underscore to the start of the variable name to indicate that this is a private variable which will be used internally as opposed to something which an external class can observe. It's kind of just a convention. It's definitely not something you have to do. Anyways, suppose we have some kind of data event, data or event stream 
we want to observe, but it comes from an external class. Well, what we can do in that case is just add a regular old flow. So below driver view model, we're going to say private val underscore ride model. And that is going to be a flow of type service result. And inside the service result, it will be a ride. And uh, that's going to equal ride service dot ride flow. And this is something, a flow, which is actually going to be returned through our ride service. So let's take a quick look at that. So what we're actually subscribing to is ride flow here. And as you can see here, it is of type flow and it contains a service result. So if my mouse click will work, there we go. Um, basically what a service result is, it's just like a generic result wrapper or either monad type thing. It just represents either a, a value, which is kind of like a success case, or at least a case which isn't a critical failure. Whereas failures are generally reserved for situations where something has gone so wrong that we basically have to abort whatever feature we're in. Anyways, um, we'll look later on at how to create these flows in sort of the client side backend of the application, but that's just to give you an idea of what we're actually returning here. It is a flow that we're assigning to our ride model here. Now, our map is ready mutable state flow is here because one quirk about Google Maps is that uh, sort of fragment or activity side, it needs to tell you when it's ready and you have to wait for that before using it. So this is another sort of event stream that we're going to be representing um, sort of using a state flow, which happens to be when our map is ready to go. We'll see how that kind of works later on at towards the end of this course when we talk about working with Google Maps and services and that kind of thing. In the overview of this section, I discussed that we wanted to build some kind of a state machine, which will take in a bunch of event streams and spit out a UI model. We are going to do that using another tool from Gabor Varadi called Combine Tuple. At first, what you're looking at here with Combine Tuple might seem super complicated, but in a sense, how it works is pretty straightforward. So I don't want you to get too intimidated by the code you're looking at here. Suppose we have several asynchronous event streams that we want to compose together. So we can think of that as being our arguments here, event stream one, event stream two, event stream three, for example. And what we want to do is we want to output the result of all of these different event streams or like a snapshot of them as a single observable value. So combined tuple allows us to specify the event streams here. And then it produces some kind of tuple, which you can see sort of popping up here. Pair and triple are actually classes from the Kotlin standard library. Uh, beyond that, I, I'm not sure if there's like a quadruple or whatever, but basically beyond triple, you have to create your own tuple classes. And Gabor also has an, a repository available, which can show you how to do that. Okay, so we're going to write some of this code out, but as you can see down below, I have it ready to go because it's kind of complicated and I don't want to screw it up. So basically what we're going to do is we're going to start by creating a UI state variable and it's going to equal combined tuple. The arguments for combined tuple are going to be our different uh, sort of event streams or, or flows is another way of putting it. So that's going to be driver model in this case, ride model, and also map is ready. And then we can close off that uh, body there. Now, what we want to do next is we want to sort of set up our tuple. And what that's going to look like is create some uh, parentheses and just type, for example, driver, uh, da, 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 where am I looking, ride result, <laughs> and is map ready, which just makes them a little bit more human readable. Okay, cool. Now, um, it is complaining because I missed a key part here. So what we need to do is we need to map. So in order to combine these different event streams and then output a single object, we're going to use the map function. So map is a very common function, which we'll see in frameworks and languages. Uh, the basic idea is we, ca we take some kind of input and we map or transform it into some other particular kind of output. Um, in this particular case, we're taking the data that arrives as our tuple, and we're going to be producing some UI states, which we'll take a look at in a minute. Okay, so we're gonna add something in here. So if ride result is service result.failure, 
then what we want to do is we want to say return at map driver dashboard ui state dot error so what's going on here basically if we return null for our ride result that's okay if we return service result dot failure basically that means we were not able to return the accurate data for a particular ride and that's potentially a huge problem if a driver is currently in an active ride and we're just not able to load that data at the moment and then we allow them to get set up in another ride you can imagine how that would cause a lot of issues with our state so basically if we're not able to get the data even if it's null then we pretty much just abort anyways let's add another line so val ride equals so uh, we're going to say ride result which is our service result as service result dot value which we know for sure it must be dot value so we're sort of unwrapping the service result here and again this could be null and then we want to have another check here so we're going to say if driver equals null or not is map ready then we want to return driver dashboard ui state dot loading now why are we doing this so there are some situations, well, one specific situation where it's okay if the driver value is null, and that is when we have not yet fetched the data from the back end. As for is map ready, again, basically we don't want to start messing around with the user interface too much until we know that the Google map is actually ready to go. And with that, we can add in our else statement. And so what we're going to do is we're going to say if ride equals null, then we are going to return driver dashboard UI state dot searching for passengers so when ride is null but we've asserted that there isn't an actual error going on it basically just means that the driver is not currently associated with a particular ride and that means they want to be searching for passengers okay so what i did at this point is i deleted what i was writing and i just went down and uncommented the ui state combined tuple and the reason for it is the rest of this function is super repetitive and it's not something I want to waste either of our time sort of repeating. But what we will do is we will jump into our uh, driver dashboard UI state and take a look at how that works. So I'm just going to mouse wheel click if my mouse will let me. So as you can see here, we're using a sealed interface. And basically the idea is for each distinct sort of state of the screen, we create either an object in the case of something that doesn't require any data so also we have like error and loading down here and then for the states of the screen that do require data we include all of that data in a data class okay one last thing i want to emphasize here notice how every branch in the execution of the block inside of this map function terminates in a driver dashboard ui state this is important if any of these branches didn't terminate then the inferred type from ui state would most likely be a flow of type any. So I just want to point that out. You might get some weird behavior or some errors otherwise. So at this point, we can uncomment the rest of the code in this class. I've selected all, the, all of the code and on Windows, I'm going to hit control forward slash. On Mac, it should be command forward slash. And there's one other thing that we want to uncomment, which is down here somewhere, which is the get driver function. And we're good to go. Okay, so I've opened up driver dashboard fragment. So at this point, or maybe you did this before, go ahead and uncomment all of the commented out code. Again, you can select it all and use control forward slash or command forward slash. So I'm gonna do that now. Also in the start requesting location updates function towards the bottom of this fragment, go ahead and uncomment this block. Okay, so we're in on view created. So to observe our UI state variable from the view model, what we're going to do is we're going to say lifecycle scope dot launch. And what that's going to do is it's going to launch a coroutine which will continue to listen to updates to this flow until the fragment stops, hence lifecycle scope. Now uh, flow with, so just emphasize emphasis here on we're calling this on the UI state variable of the view model. So flow with lifecycle, basically what this means is that we're not going to collect any values, so this block down here isn't going to be activated until the lifecycle of this fragment has started. For distinct until changed, sort of how that works is, let's say a value that would pop up and collect happens to be exactly the same as the previous value which had popped up and collect. It's basically just not gonna bother uh, emitting that. 
And that's useful because it's going to help us to avoid unnecessary redrawing of the user interface, essentially. If you are familiar with live data, this is all very similar to, for example, calling observe on a live data object. All right, so what we're going to do next is we're going to jump into update UI. Come on, mouse wheel, you can do it. All right, there we go. <laughs> All right, so in our update UI function, we basically are going to be drawing the user interface based on the state that we pass into it. Um, I just want to highlight one particular part here, which is UI state does not equal driver dashboard UI state dot searching for passengers. Basically how this works is I don't want the user to be able to jump into their profile and for example, change their type from passenger to driver while they are in an active ride. So unless they're in like the neutral state, like searching for a passenger, uh, we're basically going to be hiding the toolbar so they can't do that. The rest of this function is pretty straightforward. We just pass it into kind of helper functions which will render the user interface appropriately. Um, we will revisit this fragment later on when we're working with Google Maps. In particular, we'll look into the update map function and things related to that. But uh, that's sort of the, the primary things that we need to cover for now. When I was first designing this application, I was planning to use Firebase Real-Time Database to store user data. When I learned that Stream's chat SDK allows you to add extra data to users, I figured, why not just do that instead? Now, I still needed some way of handling authorization, and I decided to keep Firebase Auth around for that purpose. In this app, I use Firebase email and password authentication. I don't actually recommend that for production necessarily, I just chose it because it was really easy to implement. Another cool thing about Stream is that they have integration with Firebase. For more information on setting this up, please visit this blog post or search Stream Chat Firebase Extensions. Essentially what will happen is, once we create a user in Firebase Auth, that will automatically create a user in the Stream server. However, we still have to update the extra user data in Stream after we successfully create the user in Firebase. This is where use cases come in. Anytime we need to call something in Firebase first, then with the stream client, we will do that with a use case. Okay, so here's our use case for creating a new user. So auth service is actually going to be a Firebase auth service and user service is actually a class which uses streams chat client, which we will look at shortly. Let's take a quick look at Firebase auth service. So we're definitely not gonna be writing this code out as the Firebase documentation is plenty good to learn from. The only thing I want to emphasize here is we have our await function here. So tools like Firebase and StreamChat typically expose two different ways to request asynchronous data. So you could, for example, do something like dot uh, add on success or on complete listener or something like that. Um, and then there's also a way to sort of request a, uh, request a result sequentially. And that's what using await in Firebase does here. So. I, when we're sort of in a suspend function or something like that, or, or a launch block, like I said before, I generally tend to prefer sync or sequential calls as opposed to having callbacks. We will see the same pattern pop up when we're working with the stream chat SDK. All of the work that we will be doing with stream will be via a chat client, which you can see we are building one down here. Now in the Unter app file, you can see how we configure it for this particular project. One thing I want to emphasize here, so before you can use Stream, you will need to register with Stream to get a hold of an API key. Now, at the time of making this video, Stream provides a free 30-day trial period, which is a pretty damn good deal, and it can help you get set up with an API key pretty much right away. Also note that Stream has an offline plugin, which you can use if you want to read about online offline persistence. In this particular case, because we have a ride sharing app and we're super concerned about the state of the server as opposed to any cache state, we're not really gonna be using it, but I just wanted to let you know that there is an option for it and it's an interesting tool. After we successfully create a user in Firebase, we need to initialize that user with its user data inside of Stream. And we're gonna look at that process now. One thing I just wanted to emphasize here, notice how I have this with context coroutine builder. This is a quick and easy way, for example, in a suspend function to jump onto a different thread. Generally speaking, if you're working with like remote IO communications or any kind of long running operations, you're going to want to avoid doing that on the main thread. And this is a super quick way of doing it. Okay, so go ahead and click inside the bracket here and then hit enter a couple times. 
So the first thing we're going to do is we're going to call disconnect user and we're going to pass in the user ID, which came in from our use case. Basically, we just want to be absolutely sure that the chat client, and let me show you what that looks like. So up at the top of this class, we're given our chat client, which we configured earlier. We want to make sure that our chat client isn't holding on to any old state or anything like that. And you can see the disconnect user function down here. It basically just requests the current user from the client. And if it doesn't equal null and it doesn't match the current user ID, then we call disconnect. Now, this is something that you may not need to configure. This is a bit of an edge case. So what we're gonna do is we're going to add in an artificial delay. Now, why is this here? Um, I think this has to do with basically the fact that when you're working with stream integration with Firebase at the time of making this video, there's a bit of a lag time between the configuration between those two different backends. Just be aware if you get some strange behavior and strange state issues immediately after creating your user in Firebase and attempting to connect, then you might need to add an artificial delay. I suggest you try this out without the delay and then first. And then the other thing is if you're not using Firebase, I'm really quite confident you won't have to add this delay in here. Okay, so now we're going to create a stream user. So we're gonna say val stream user equals, and we're going to say user. So this is of type uh, stream user, and we're going to give it for the ID parameter, user.userID. For the name, we're going to use user.username. And this is an example of something we weren't able to initialize in Firebase, which is why we need to add it in here. And here is a real, really critical and important part of this application, which largely drives the whole application. There's another field we can supply here called extra data. So both for users and channels, which we'll look at later on, Stream allows you to store, I don't wanna say arbitrary data, but almost arbitrary data, although it does have a limit, I think it's like five kilobytes or something like that, um, on a particular user or a channel. And this is how we're actually going to be storing this data uh, in Stream, essentially, without having to use like Firebase uh, real-time database or something like that. Anyways, how this basically works is we're going to give it a mutable map of, and so this map is going to take key value pairs. So we could do key status to user.status and key type to user.type. Now the user type, when a new user is created, created initially, it's defaulted to passenger. And if you're wondering what these keys are, I'm just gonna mouse wheel click on here. And this is basically just a big file I have here called constants.kt. And you can pretty much choose whatever names you want for these keys. The only thing is you don't want to choose a name of a field which is already observed, sorry, reserved. Uh, but if you do anything like that, you will get an error from stream and they'll tell you exactly what the issue is, which is kind of handy. So the next thing we need to do is create a dev token. So we're gonna say val dev token equals client dot dev token and we're going to supply user dot user id in there so in order to make sure that we have an authenticated user we need to have a jwt available for that user jwt means json web token which is like an acronym inception when you think about it anyways normally this is something that would come from you or your company's back-end authentication server that is totally outside of the scope of this tutorial, so we will use a handy workaround instead. The dev token function will generate a JWT for us. This is sufficient for like debugging and testing purposes, purposes and things like that, but it's not necessarily something you would want to do in a production environment. Now we will actually get set up or initialize the new user. So we're going to type val result equals client dot connect user. We're going to pass in our stream user, and we're also going to pass in our dev token. And then we are going to use an await function. The other way you could approach this is you could use the in queue function, and you could provide it with a callback of some kind. In this particular case, again, I'm going to opt for the sequential way of doing this, which is using await. And then we can add basically an if statement on our result object here. So we're gonna type result is success. And we'll just finish off our if else statement here. And if the result is success, then we just return service result.user. And if there is an error, then we're going to type service result.failure. 
and inside of it we're going to say exception. So we're going to create a Kotlin exception here and then we're going to type result.error.cause and that's going to create an exception which will basically inform us what any errors if they occur happen to be. And that is how we create a user in stream. Pretty simple. Now we're going to take a look at some new functions. Instead of writing them all out, I will just highlight the important differences because they're all pretty similar and there's not a whole lot new. So the first thing we're going to look at is update user. So in order to update a user without totally wiping out their data, like for example, if we just want to update specific fields, then we're going to want to be using a chat client, is what this is again, a partial update user. And what that will do is any key that we include will be updated, but the ones that are like already set, we're not going to be removing them. And again, we're just using the await and checking if that was successful or not. Now I have to point out something very, very important here. Notice how I am setting the key role, which is actually a field in the, like a standard field in the uh, user model for uh, stream user. Um, this is not actually something that I recommend you do uh, unless you know what you're doing. The reason why I've done this in this application is it basically has made it easier to manage user data and query channels that a user doesn't happen to be a member to. Um, however, understand that this was done kind of quick and hacky and I generally don't advise making every user in your application an administrator. With that being said, you can jump into the uh, stream dashboard and modify roles and permissions as you see fit. So I definitely suggest that you look into the stream documentation if that's something you're interested in modifying. Okay, so we're now going to look at a multi-purpose function which is get user by ID. It's a bit of a long one, but uh, a lot of it's very repetitive, so we're not going to be writing it out. So basically what we do is we're saying client.getCurrentUser, and what that's going to do is it's going to get the user state currently associated with our chat client, quite obviously. And what we're going to do is if that value is null, it means that no one is currently associated with, uh, or no one is basically logged in essentially. And if it doesn't equal null and it matches the current user ID, then we can just go ahead and take the data from that current user. So here we're saying current user dot extra data and we're extracting keys from it. And we end up just returning that to the front end. Also notice here I update the role to uh, admin uh, if necessary. But again, not really something I suggest in production. Anyways, the other thing that can happen is there is a user who is currently logged in but their ID doesn't match the ID of the user we're trying to sort of log into. In that particular case, we're going to use streams switch user function here, which is pretty similar to connect user, but obviously slightly different. And then pretty much the same thing. We just, if that's successful, get that data and return it to the front end. The other thing that can occur is that our um, get current user function returns null. And this is essentially equivalent to, to no one is logged into our application. And so how that works is in that particular case, we will again call connect user based on the user ID that was passed in here. Now it's important to understand that this function will only be called if the user has, sorry, wrong uh, use case here, log in user is what I want. Um, that function get user by ID will only ever be called once the user has successfully authenticated with their email and password or whatever else through Firebase. So the only other thing worth emphasizing is we have this log user out function here, which basically just calls client.disconnect and flushes the persistence. So yeah, that's basically in general how to manage users, at least uh, in a basic way, uh, using the stream chat client. We're now going to create channels, which will allow us to both have chat between drivers and passengers and reactively update our UI states. We are going to store all of the data associated with a particular ride as extra data for a channel. Now, here's where things get really neat. Stream has a built-in way to monitor changes to various kinds of states and events, such as the state of a channel. Once a driver and passenger are connected, they will both be observing these state changes and their user interfaces will react accordingly. Coding something like this by hand is tricky, but you'll see that we don't need to set up our own socket connections or write some kind of complicated server polling logic to achieve this. Creating a new channel in stream is actually pretty similar to creating a new user in a lot of ways. 
Um, we are going to want to generate a unique ID for our channel. And to do that, I've actually borrowed a function from this repository here, which is github.com slash getstream slash stream dash or hyphen draw hyphen Android. And special thanks to Jaewong Um, who I believe has done most of the work on this particular project. Um, I strongly suggest that you check this particular project out if you're interested in what we're going to be talking about later, which is sort of reactively updating the user interface based on sort of cross-client communication. Most of what I learned uh, to do with reactive state and stream SDK came from that particular repository. So I strongly suggest you check it out. Let's just return to create ride. So one thing I want to emphasize here is the channel type. Let's just mouse click in. Come on, there we go. So uh, Stream exposes, if I recall correctly, four default channel types. I couldn't tell you them all, but one of them is messaging and one of them is live stream. Now, why did I pick that uh, particular kind of um, channel type? So I chose a live stream channel type because it allows the channel to be publicly queried by people who aren't already members of the channel. So for example, drivers who are querying open rides. Now, I'm told by my friend Nash from Stream that you can actually modify existing channel settings in the Stream dashboard, so consider looking into that as well. This is just like a quick and dirty way of making open or publicly available channels. So other than that, I just want to emphasize our member IDs here. So when we create this particular channel, and channels in this application are created by passengers, essentially a, a new ride is created by a passenger, then we add that passenger automatically to the uh, the list of IDs associated with that particular channel. Let's go to querying an in-progress ride. So whether or not you're a driver or a passenger, you might have a ride which is currently active, and this is basically how we get to it. So when the user enters the dashboard feature, whether they are a passenger or driver, we want to check if they have an ongoing ride. This is especially important because we're not caching this data. So I just want to emphasize here how we actually do the querying of both open rides or a ride which a user is currently associated with. Now, please understand that in a production app, I wouldn't necessarily just simply grab the most recent channel uh, that has our user ID in it. And that's effectively what we're doing here. We're filtering channels based on matching a member, so um, any kind of member ID, with the current user ID, we're basically filtering by the most recently updated channel, and we're just returning a limit of one. Um, there are situations like I would want to know if a user is active in multiple channels, because that would probably indicate some kind of a state issue. So if you want to improve upon the application, that might be something you want to uh, look into. Basically what happens next is we call query channels with our query request, and we await it again. Now, if there's no channels returned, that basically indicates that the hopefully the user doesn't have any ride or channel that they are currently associated with. So that would, for the, de the passenger, mean that they uh, haven't created a ride. For a driver, it means they're not in a ride. Uh, whereas if they are associated with something particular, then we request the channel CID. Now, I want to emphasize a, an important point here that confused me a little bit. Um, there's two things with stream when it comes to IDs. There's a CID which is comprised of the type of channel and the ID. Let's just say the ID happens to be one, two, three, four, five, six. And then there is an ID which is basically just the ID. So adding a driver to a ride is pretty straightforward. So in the uh, driver's sort of default state, they are provided with a list of active rides. And what they can do is they can select one of those rides and then connect to it. In that case, we pass in both the ride data as well as the driver here. And then the process from here is pretty straightforward. So what we can do is we just basically call channel client, which we build from the CID by using client.channel. And then we call uh, channel client add members, and we provide it with the uh, current user's ID. Or in retrospect, I probably could use the ID from our driver object. Now, one thing we don't do in this application is we don't actually restrict which rides can be seen by any particular driver, geographically speaking. So 
I could be a driver here in Canada and someone could basically like create a ride down in Australia and I would be able to see that as a driver here in Canada. Hey, you going, Mike? Uh, but yeah, that's obviously not something you would want to do in production. Again, we're calling update partial because uh, we don't want to completely wipe out the data. We just want to update particular fields. I want to emphasize that we're setting the ride status here to passenger pickup, which is very important. Regarding getting that list of open rides, we have our observe open rides function. So again, how this works is we're going to create a query channel request, and we're going to be looking specifically for rides which have a state of searching for driver. And we make this list sort of available through a flowable, which we can sort of mouse click on here. And as you can see, we have a mutable state flow, which exposes a list of rides, and we initialize that to an empty list. So what we're gonna learn now is how to observe a channel and then also listen for updates, which is really key. So basically what we do is we pass in a particular ride ID that we want to start observing, and we create a channel client. Now, one thing that's probably a little bit strange here is we're calling add members here. It isn't really necessary for us to like re-add the user. Um, it's just gonna get sort of overwritten. But by calling add members here and making sure that that call is successful, it's gonna sort of give us access to the latest data in the channel. I'm really quite sure there's an easier, easier way to do this, but to be perfectly honest, I didn't notice this until I was pretty far into the uh, recording process. So it is what it is. But anyways, the important thing here is if we successfully retrieve that channel and the latest data for it, we're going to be calling observe channel events. And this is a critically important function for you to understand. Channel client has various subscribe functions which allow us to listen to specific or any kind of message or update which occurs on the channel. This is how the UI reacts or the updates reactively across multiple different clients. Internally, my understanding is that Stream uses a socket connection, which is kind of like a network communication which maintains a two-way data flow between a client and a server, or in this case, sort of like client, server, client. So anyways, let's go to channel event deleted. So this is gonna pop up when either the driver or the user deletes a channel. And what we do is we just immediately make our uh, ride model null and that's gonna reset the UI state to um, sort of like the uh, default state. We also have channel updated by user events. Again, really important. This could be a situation where the uh, driver signals that they have um, dropped off the user or something like that. And then we also have this new message event thing here. And so this block is gonna be triggered when a message is sent either by a driver or a passenger here. So calling channel client.create here is kind of similar to calling add members from before. Basically, I just want a function which returns the latest channel data to me. And this block of code here basically says it, well, it just indicates whether or not a message has been sent by the driver or passenger. Again, full disclosure here, this was originally intended to count unread messages and display that in the user interface. But my decision to use a live stream channel meant that all of the messages are considered read. Now, you can fix that in the stream dashboard. I just didn't learn how to fix it until pretty much after I was done working on the code. There's plenty of other functions in this class, so you might want to pause the video and take a look around. And this code was written over the span of like a couple of weeks, so I'm sure you can find plenty of room to improve upon if you go looking. Okay, so go ahead and jump into passenger dashboard fragment. Now, if you haven't done so already, there's a bunch of code in this particular file which was uh, commented. You can go ahead and uncommented that, assuming you have added the XML file, which we created much earlier on. And again, you can do that by selecting the commented code and hitting control forward slash or command forward slash if you're on a Mac. Anyways, so I've navigated towards the bottom of passenger dashboard fragment. Now, we will write some of the code to do with maps and directions, but we're not going to write out all of this boilerplate permission code together because I don't want to hate myself. Let's take a look at our request permission function here. We need to have access to the user's find location, which basically means that we need to know exactly where they are. The way that we can do that is by setting up a request permission launcher. If they have not yet granted a permission, then we fire that launcher here, and that is going to, depending on the result of um, the dialog box that pops up, it's going the result is going to pop up in here. 
and then if it's granted, we jump into request location. Otherwise, we inform the user that, hey, you're not able to use this application unless you give us your location data because this is a ride-sharing application. And then uh, inside of view model handle error, it's basically just going to bump the user to the login screen. But yeah, if they have already allowed the permission, then we basically just jump into request location. Now, I've just noticed something which might be a bit of an issue, which is that I don't think we're calling map get map async. So there's a pretty good chance that I made a mistake here, and we should actually call that down here as well. Uh, so that's possibly a cause of an error, which I didn't catch until now, just FYI. Now we'll jump into the request location call site. Now this gigantic load of boilerplate code allows us to start getting the user's latitude and longitude. Uh, I just want to emphasize a few parts here. So um, yeah, we do all our permission checks again. And um, one thing we're doing here is we're setting the minimum update distance in mirrors, meters. Um, what this basically does is when we make our request to see the user's location, we don't really want to get location updates unless the user has actually moved like more than 10 meters. There's other things here like we want to make sure that it's highly accurate and we have a request interval which is, um, I think, 10 seconds here. So lots more you can do to sort of configure things. But And here's the thing. If I was working on a production app, I would spend a lot more time making sure that we're respecting the user's data and also not wasting bandwidth and making excess API calls. But for this particular application, this is all the configuration that we do. Down below here, we have this location settings request builder which we apply. And then we also here have this check location settings boilerplate code. Basically what we're doing here is this thing is taking our sort of location request and it's making sure that the device that it's running on is actually capable of carrying out these requests. And if that's not the case, we inform the user that the system is not capable uh, or system settings are preventing uh, location updates. Let's go into start requesting location updates. So assuming we are, we pass all of those different checks and balances here, we're finally able to start actually requesting the user's location. And what we can do there is we can say location client dot last location, and then we add an on complete listener here. And this is where we will actually be getting the user's current latitude and longitude. And then we're going to be updating that frequently, basically every time it updates pretty much. If that seems like a gigantic load of boilerplate code just to do something which in theory should be pretty simple, welcome to Android development. Okay, so next we're going to see how to set up the address search bar which patch passengers use to choose a destination for their ride. So there are two UI components which achieve this feature. We have the uh, search edit text. Let's go ahead and open up the uh, fragment here. So fragment passenger dashboard. And let me see where, okay, this is pretty much where it is. So the two different things that we're using is a material autocomplete text view uh, for the actual text field. Why it's called a text view, I couldn't answer that question, but it is like something you can type things into and it's sort of the basis of our autocomplete. And then we also have a list down below called autocomplete results. And this is where we actually display the results, the autocomplete results as the user is typing. Let's open up the adapter. So it's called autocomplete adapter or autocomplete results adapter. So this is just a pretty typical recycler view dot list adapter. We have our diff util in here. If you didn't know this before, one really quick way of creating this is to just create an object in here. There's nothing really special going on here if you're familiar with recycler views, but I do want to emphasize that this is how we actually handle the clicks. I set up a Kotlin function type and how that works is when we create this adapter, we pass in a lambda expression here. See, we have handle item click. And then when an item is clicked, we pass in the autocomplete model into our view model here. Let's just have a quick look at how that works. So we jump in here and we make a request to Google services dot get place coordinates. And uh, let's jump in there. So basically how this works is we make a request to fetch places and that's going to return some extra data about this particular address or location. This is important because we want to get the address of the selected place basically from the places request so that we can actually display it to, for example, the, uh, the destination for the uh, passenger or the passenger's address uh, for the driver or things like that. 
Once that's done, we attempt to actually create a new ride, and if that's successful, then we update the state. Anyways, back to ride and active state in the fragment. So another important piece here is the do on text changed function, which we use to actually monitor for changes in the search text field. Now, uh, I really wanna emphasize this here again. This is like a weekend or less implementation. It's very important that you are not making a whole bunch of excessive useless calls to Google services because that is going to cost you money. Um, here, what we're doing is we're making sure that the text isn't blank and it's more than three characters, but honestly, I would want to do more robust sort of checks and balances than just that. But like I say, it gets the job done. Let's uh, just mouse click in here. Um, what's going on here is in this particular case, as the user is typing, we are basically requesting autocomplete results from our Google service. And so what this is gonna do is it's going to create an autocomplete session. And one thing you'd wanna do, like I'm limiting the results to Canada, which is important. Again, you would wanna do some pretty robust checking and make sure you've got this thing configured pretty well. But as the user types their query, which is the text inside of the search field, then we're going to be making these sort of autocomplete requests based on that. And then when that gets pushed back into the view model, we're going to be updating a flow called autocomplete list, which is basically a list of autocomplete models, which you can see up here. And then if we jump back into the fragment, we're going to be basically observing or collecting that particular list. And that is how we are constantly updating the recycler view, which has the autocomplete results. Okay, we're now gonna learn about maps and drawing directions and markers and that kind of thing on the map. So I want to bring your attention to the on map ready callback, which we have added to our fragment at the top here. And let's just go ahead to, I'm gonna hit control F and go to on map ready. There we are. So basically what this is, is before we actually start working with our Google map in the layout, this function needs to be called. And so that's why earlier we had that flowable, which basically was associated with, uh, is the map ready? Anyways, once the map is ready, we can do some basic configurations here. So uh, there's a lot more you could do, but for example, is zoom controls enabled allows the user to zoom. We're also allowing them to use whatever gestures they're basically used to if they're, um, you know, compared to like what they would normally use in uh, Google Maps, the application. And then we're also setting a minimum zoom preference. So for zoom levels, zero is like maximally zoomed out where you can see like half or the whole planet. And then somewhere around 18 is like the minimum level that is actually useful to use. I'm not exactly sure what it is, but maybe like a block or something like that. So we basically just set it so that the user can zoom out to like a portion of a city, but they can't zoom out further than that. Okay, now we're gonna go back to the update UI function, which is towards the top here somewhere. And I just want to point out that when we update the UI, so if you've jumped ahead and you skipped the part of this tutorial on view models, you're probably gonna to wanna to go back and watch that. But when we update the UI state, we also call update map. And this is basically a part of the application or the fragment, which is going to update the map itself based on the data that we provide to it. Okay, so we are actually gonna write some code now. So inside of the UI state for searching for driver, what we're gonna do is we're going to move the camera, which is sort of like the view of the map or, or the lens or whatever, uh, over top of where the passenger's position is. And this would be in the state where they have created a ride and they're waiting for a driver to appear. Okay, so inside of here, we're gonna say Google map, exclamation, exclamation, because we're pretty sure it's not null at this point. And we're gonna call move camera. To do that, we're gonna use a camera update factory and we'll do new lat long zoom. Inside of this, we're gonna create a lat long object. Be a little bit careful which one you're picking. There's a lat long for com.google.maps.model and there's one for com.google.android.gms.maps.model. And if you're getting some kind of weird type error, you've probably imported the wrong one. Anyways, we're gonna use this one here. And for the values here, we're gonna say UI state dot passenger lat and UI state dot passenger lawn. And all of this data comes in from the back end, which is pretty handy. For the zoom level, we're just gonna do 14F. So that's basically how you center the camera on a particular location. Now we are going to figure out how to actually draw directions on the map, which is pretty cool.
So what we're going to do is we're going to say val dear result equals directions API dot new request. Inside of here, we're going to say uh, basically, um, so in this particular case, we have in Unter app a, where is it, a geo context. And this is something that we need to create and get a hook to if we want to be using the directions API. How we're going to do that is we are going to type, just give me one second here, uh, inside of here, require activity dot application. And then we're going to cast that as Unter app. And then we're going to request the geo context like so. And that should satisfy that issue there. And then the next thing we're going to do is we're going to make some modifications to this directions result. So first we're going to add a mode and we're going to pick travel mode dot driving in this particular case, because obviously this is like a ride sharing app. Uh, we also want to specify the units that we're working with. We're going to use unit dot uh, metric. You can use Imperial if you're from America. And then we're also gonna do region will be Canada. And uh, the other thing we want to do is we need to set the origin and the destination, which is going to be really important. We're getting directions from one particular point on the map to another. So that's where the origin and destination come from. So this is where things get a little annoying with lat LNG. So inside of here, we're going to type com.google.maps dot model dot lat long. And the reason why is what I described before where we have two different lat longs. So inside of here, we're going to say UI state dot passenger lat and UI state dot passenger lawn. Let's just go ahead and copy this and paste it below. We'll change this to destination and we'll use driver lat and driver lawn instead. And then finally, we're again going to call await. Now, I'm sure there's some kind of clean code zealot watching this right now and screaming, hey, you're making a remote API call in a fragment. Isn't that breaking the SRP and all that kind of stuff? The reason why I'm making this call here is because it's easy to make the call here and it works. Okay, so the next part is so tricky to write that I'm not even going to try. We're just going to basically select it and uncomment it. And what I'll do is I'll talk you through it. Okay, so assuming we actually return a route, which that's what all these checks up here are about, we can draw the directions on the map. The way that we can do this is by adding polylines uh, over top of the map, which are basically like drawings on the map. So the polyline is going to be based on the directions that we receive from this particular route. Now, I want to give a shout out to Ilori, Aluasagun, I'm really sorry if I mispronounce your name, I'm doing my best, but just shout out to Elori for mentioning this cool poly util. So this is something which is available from the android-maps-utils dependency, which you can find in the app level build gradle file. Basically what it does is it takes all of the complex location data from our route and it converts that data into a collection of points, which will be drawn as neat, nice polylines on the map. Now, down below here, basically what we're saying here, and don't ask me what roots and legs and all this stuff means, I have no idea. But basically, if we want to display how far away uh, the driver is, for example, then we can get that by getting a leg and basically getting the distance in a human readable format from it. And that's basically how we update this particular text field. Okay, so finally, let's have a look at adding markers to our map. This is pretty straightforward. So let's say we want to add a marker for where the passenger is. A really easy way to do this is to call Google Map dot uh, add marker. And then the marker options are basically what you use to make changes to how the marker functions and looks and that kind of thing. For the passenger, we just use like a generic marker and we provide the latitude and longitude of the passenger. For the driver, we do something a little bit fancier, which is we actually change the drawable to this sort of car icon thing here, which is an SVG. And then we make that the marker of the driver. And it's just a little bit more user-friendly that way. There's of course a lot more you configure, but this should hopefully get you started with Google Maps, places, directions, and so forth. Congratulations if you made it all the way through this tutorial. I tried a different approach with this one where it followed a more code lab style. My hope is that I was able to highlight the important things and give you a guide to studying the source code. 
At the end of the day, I do most of my learning from source code, and my goal is to make that transition a little bit easier for you. Also, thank you again to Stream for making this tutorial possible. I would not have made it without their support. Thank you again for watching Cousins, and maybe I will see you in a live stream at some point.